So now we turn our attention to energy systems, and it's returned to some familiar territory for people that did one and two last year. And if it's something new for you, feel free to pick the brains of those people or ask for the PowerPoints from last year to give you a bit more of a background. So the key knowledge is pretty simple. It basically just looks at how we get uh, different sources of food fuels into our body and how they convert to chemical fuels to help restore or resynthesize ATP, which is a chemical compound that produces energy for movement when it splits. And then just to be able to apply that according to intensity, duration, type of exercise, etc. Look at how the energy systems work together. So the overarching question is, how do we create energy for movement? That's the quintessential question for energy systems. As for skill learning and biomechanics, these PowerPoints for energy systems and future topics all have guiding questions to help direct you through the slides and also to focus your energy and attention when you're reading any resource material, including the Phys Ed Notes Green Book and the Connect Student Notes Book. Importantly, you need to know that there's only one chemical compound that can break down that gives us energy for the muscles to work, and that's ATP. And here's the first of a number of diagrams that helps to explain that. You will find one that you like. Borrow that. Okay. The mystery of energy systems is that they all work together, breaking down stored chemical compounds to restore um, ATP. When ATP splits, ADP is formed, energy for movement um, is released, and inorganic phosphate is a byproduct. A fancy name for the chemical fuels is substrates, so don't be put off by that if you see it in a question. So adenosine triphosphate is the fancy name for ATP, which is a chemical compound formed by one adenosine molecule and three phosphates. Okay, that's ATP. Tri means three phosphates. When we want to do some uh, activity, we have to break this bad boy down, and we do that, um, and in the process, ATP becomes adenosine diphosphate. Di means two. So we drop a phosphate bond that becomes inorganic phosphate, and in the process, we get energy for movement. So we've said ATP is incredibly limited, okay? Enough for two maximal vertical jumps. That's not a lot. So we are consistently replenishing, restoring, resynthesizing ATP. It's just a matter of how hard we work, uh, how long we work. Um, our dietary status, our training status, there's a whole range of variables that will have an uh, impact on which energy system we use in which proportion and which chemical fuels we use to provide that to restore ATP. In terms of getting your vocabulary right, when we talk about fuels for energy, we're talking about the food form and then also the chemical form that's converted to in the body to restore ATP from ADP. ATP is not considered a fuel. It's a chemical compound. Uh, it's the currency by which all the chemical fuels uh, restore or convert to give us energy for movement. The first fuel we'll look at is creatine. It can be called creatine phosphate or phosphocreatine. While it can be found in small amounts in some lean meats, and you could also get it in powder form as a supplement, it's still considered a chemical fuel rather than a food fuel because the body basically produces it inside itself in the kidneys and liver, stored in the muscle. It's used, uh, the supplement forms used for power athletes to get maybe a fraction of an edge in terms of the stores of creatine. And the ATP CP system uses this fuel. Carbohydrate and CHO is a suitable uh, abbreviation for that. Is a food fuel. We eat carbs, but that then converts to glycogen in the body. This fuel can be used by both the anaerobic glycolysis system and the aerobic energy system. It's the only fuel that can be broken down with or without oxygen. If you can remember from units one, two, aerobic versus anaerobic energy systems, aerobic uses oxygen to break down the fuels. Anaerobic does not make use of oxygen to break down fuels. There's a couple of other benefits there for you. Very important for endurance athletes. Moving on to fats is another food fuel. We eat fats. But they are stored in the body as uh, triglycerides. And you can see that there's some unhealthy fats on the right-hand side. There's also some healthy fats. But it's only the aerobic energy system which can use this fuel. We prefer to use it um, at rest because it gives us a lot of ATP per gram of fat. Um, obviously, it has dietary issues if you over overeat it. But it's certainly the preferred food fuel, which is a stored chemical fuel of triglycerides for when the body's working at uh, relatively low intensity for long duration. Interest 
interestingly, there's at least five days worth of fats in our body if we're working at 60% max heart rate continuously. So, challenge you. The food fuel, there is protein. Importantly, it's incredibly rare to use this in a sporting scenario. If you think about um, ultra, ultra endurance events, I've just said that if you worked for 60% max heart rate five days straight, you'd still have enough fats. So protein wouldn't be contributing to the back end of that particular event. So in terms of sport, irrelevant for energy systems. In terms of powering your body, increasing lean muscle mass and that kind of thing, very, very important. But from an energy systems perspective, negligible. This table here seeks to show you the relationship between food sources that we consume, uh, how they are transported through the body, so the smaller, if you like, chemical um, format, and then how they are stored in larger portions, larger concentrations um, within, the, within the body. And what happens to excess in most cases turns to fat. So carbohydrates break down first to glucose. Think of a sugar grain. Then they're stored as like sugar cubes, glycogen, in the muscle and the liver. Fats break down to free fatty acids, or FFAs, and glycerol, and they come together in the muscles as triglycerides. Protein is pretty simple, amino acids and amino acids. As I said, for energy systems, it's irrelevant. For a healthy diet, for muscle mass, for power athletes, very important. In looking at the body's use of fuels at rest, um, we'll be talking about interplay, which is another concept we touched on last year, which is how the energy systems relate. This particular slide is looking at the fuels within predominantly the aerobic system, but also due to an interplay, there will be anaerobic systems contributing. Cut a long story short, the body, when it has ample oxygen, like at rest, or very low um, percentage of max heart rate, would prefer to use fats because it's got a much higher yield of ATP than glucose. And in this case, two thirds of our fuel um, to power ATP resynthesis at rest comes from fats. So you've just seen what happens during rest, what the body would prefer to do because an abundance of oxygen. But as we start to work and as intensity increases, and if you look at your graph, that bottom axis talks about percentage of VO2 max. VO2 max is a basically aerobic um, capacity, if you like. So from zero to 100%, we see a decline in the use of fat. And that's because there's less oxygen available to break it down. There's an inverse relationship with the use of carbohydrates that starts off much lower as intensity is low. But as intensity increases, up to 100% VO2 max, carbohydrates are the only fuel the body can use at VO2 max because there is insufficient oxygen to break down fats. That's called the crossover concept. Now then, let's have a look at this one. If you have a close look, we've got a slightly different axis here. The bottom is not VO2 max, it's exercise time. And we can see that up to about just short of three hours, Carbohydrates is giving us the bulk of our ATP. But once we get past that almost, I'll say, two hours, 50 minutes mark for this particular sample, fat then becomes uh, the major contributor. So this crossover concept, I suppose, is looking at duration beyond one's limits of glycogen. So you'll hear somewhere between 90 minutes to two hours is the typical glycogen stores of most athletes. In this case here, somebody's been able to use carbohydrates preferentially up to two hours, 50 minutes. But in doing a six hour event, we extinguish our glycogen and we must then draw more on fats. I would associate that with a drop in intensity.